scriptures a little bit from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to author, alter or abolish it. Thank you, Evan. I warned him beforehand that it, the reading would be a little different this morning, but um, first of all, I can't tell you how excited I am to get to talk to you on the actual 4th of July. These opportunities don't come along very often, and it's a special day. It's a special day to us, and anyone who says that the 4th of July should not be celebrated in the church is wrong. They don't know their history because our faith and our God is so entwined in this holiday. Many groups, and I don't know if you know this or not, but many groups have pushed for the 4th of July to be considered a religious holiday. Not unlike Christmas, a religious holiday. And we're going to look at that this morning, this intertwined connection between God, His message, our faith, and the 4th of July. I had Evan read that because sometimes you just need to go back to the very beginning. The foundation of this small little idea that became this great nation. This morning some of this may be more of a history lesson than anything else. And so I'm really going to enjoy it as that's my profession. But I hope that you'll see at the end of this that we can certainly, certainly apply the Christian principles of our founding fathers to our lives this morning. So again, I tell you, happy 4th of July. It's a wonderful day. Can't wait to see the fireworks show tonight. Go celebrate. Be with your family. I tell you what, just be happy. More so, I should say, be grateful that we live in a country where we can come here this morning to worship our Lord without fear without the fear of losing our lives or being thrown in jail or being persecuted. What a grateful attitude we must have for that. And that's cause for celebration in itself, isn't it? Of course, whenever we talk about this, we go back to the original document that got it all started, the Declaration of Independence. And some of these guys out here have heard me on my soapbox before in class. I'm not going to give you the whole burn your boat uh, as, uh, you know, lecture that I'm, you know, I do every year. We don't have time. Maybe some other time I can do that. But I do want to pay attention to that and the reading because, uh, you know, they're the principles that our country are founded upon. And the authors of those, that Declaration of Independence, and it's a miss to, to historically say, well, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence and that's all you need to know. No, that's not historically accurate. He may have penned it with his hand, but many, many, many of our founding fathers were instrumental in providing the ideas. In fact, we borrowed much of what appears in the Declaration of Independence from Europe. Go back and look at the ideology present in the Declaration of Independence, and ironically enough, you're going to see guys like John Locke, who was English. We used the English philosophers against them for the Declaration of Independence. I, I think that's amazing. This morning I want to bring out a few facts for you uh, that you may not be aware of in this group of individuals that wrote such a masterful document. First of all, I don't know how many know this, but the official motto, you know, each war has its motto, the Texas Independence, which hits home to us, right? What's, our, what's the motto of that war? Remember the Alamo, right? Spanish American War, 1898, remember the Maine. These guys studied that this year. You know, and so on and so on. World War II, Pearl Harbor, right? But in the revolution, the motto which the media and a lot of historians today don't want you to know, one of the most influential and famous models of that time period was no king but King Jesus. Isn't that interesting? 
Isn't that interesting? You know, we hear a lot, no taxation without what? Representation, obviously. But I like that. No king but King Jesus, motto of the American Revolution. Of the 56 men that were there to sign that Declaration of Independence, 27 of those men were actually trained ministers. 27 of them. And the others who had received a university education were also trained in theology because the media doesn't want you to know this, but all of our earliest institutions of higher learning were schools of theology. I find it absolutely ironic of the, the stuff that's coming out of Harvard and Princeton these days. Such liberal, such a just total regard, disregard for Christianity and God's word. You know how those universities started out? 1639 Princeton, do you know what it was founded on? School of Ministers. It was a Puritan school of ministry. Isn't that ironic that they've come so far away, done a complete 180 from the purpose of which they were founded for? These gentlemen, they didn't just on July 2nd tell, tell you know, or in the preceding months tell Thomas Jefferson, hey, we need you to go write a document that tells why we want to separate from Britain. And in that document, you know, we don't really care what you put in there. Just, just put some stuff in there to make us look good. No, these gentlemen came to this. They came to the Continental Congress with their studying. These men had studied different rules of, uh, of government their entire lives. That examined every single type of government that had existed throughout history, much of which they could find in the Bible. And they came together in 1776 and said, listen, we've looked at every single possible type of government and style of governing body. And we have decided that the only one that suits our needs, that would fit this idea, and, it, and folks, it was a revolutionary idea. You know, you need to let Jan talk to you sometime about the French Revolution. I know he's mentioned it up here in the difference. Some people say that was based on the spirit of the American Revolution, and thus it came 20 years later or so, but it was a completely different thing. The idea of the American Revolution, that all men are created equal, that we should pursue life, liberty, and happiness, that was revolutionary. No one had ever said that before. No one. But the system of government that these men founded, we call today a republic. And I warned my kids, in terms of political definition, we are not a democracy. We are a republic. There is a difference. The difference is and happens when you look at who controls this country. In a republic, which we have, Okay. By definition, it is rule of law. How does God rule? Hasn't he set forth his law? Don't we read about it all the time? Doesn't he ask for us to obey it? See, a republic is based on a Christian example of rule of law. There are laws that we enter into a contract with that we say, yes, we will obey those laws. And according to John Locke, it's good as long as the government then takes care of us, that social contract. In opposition to that, a true democracy, which was attempted okay, in Europe. Okay, obviously, you've got the Greeks. You talk about Athens. You talk about the Romans, but in a true democracy, who rules? They like to say the people rule. But in actuality, it's not the people, it's the mob. It's the masses of people. Because in a true democracy, all of the people are going to decide everything. Now imagine the chaos that ensues. We saw that, didn't we? We saw that in Portland in that zone where they had no system, no laws, no nothing. 
You know what it becomes? True democracy, in the end, will always result in anarchy. And that's exactly what we had in Portland. Anarchy. No government, no rule. We live in a republic. We have an obligation to abide by the rules. Now, there's a lot of Americans out there today that don't want to make that connection. They don't want laws governing their lives. But it has been that way here since 1776. And it is the reason, folks, why we are the greatest nation in the world. We are the greatest nation in the history of the world. We have achieved things that no other organized government has ever dreamed of achieving because we are a republic and we are founded on the principles of God's word and God's law. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Moving on. One of the things that we celebrate this morning more than anything else is liberty. And that's the cornerstone, if you will, of what this republic is founded upon. Unprecedented levels of freedom. Any historian will tell you, any historian, the level of freedom and the minimal government interference was revolutionary in America from the start. And we feel like that was the key, enabling us to pursue dreams, goals, and thereby achieving a standard of living unparalleled in human history. We were able to find life, liberty, and happiness. Now, we all know that comes with a price. But this morning, that's what the 4th of July celebration is. It's a celebration of our liberty, our freedom as Americans. It's not a right that we just have been given. It's been earned. And a lot of people need to hear that. It's been earned but it is our American foundation. We all know what this is, right? You can't talk about liberty or freedom without the Liberty Bell. Uh, I went in 1984. I got to stand there in front of this thing. I was 12 years old, okay? What that picture doesn't show you is how chipped the bottom of that thing is, and we were told people have come in and tried to take a little piece of liberty with them. Uh, so they, they, in the beginnings, before they started guarding it, and of course the famous crack. But what you may not know is the inscription on the actual Liberty Bell. Anybody know what that is? It's actually part of a Bible verse. Leviticus 25.10. On that Liberty Bell it says, Proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants their uh, freedom. Leviticus 25.10. And if you take the whole scripture there, it says in verse 10, consecrate the 50th year. And he's talking about the year of Jubilee. And proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a Jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. Chapter 25 in Leviticus is, is directed towards the Jews. And it has lots of instructions in that year of Jubilee. And there are a lot of different characteristics. And in one point, a lot of people believe that that points to you're actually taking your slaves and you're liberating them. Now, that's a key point. Why? Because do you know how the term Liberty Bell came to be? It wasn't from our founding fathers. Interestingly enough, it came from an abolitionist. William Lloyd Garrison who was the most famous abolitionist, northern abolitionist, during the 19th century. He had the Liberator, which was the most powerful abolitionist newspaper uh, of, of its time. He reprinted a poem in 1844 entitled The Liberty Bell, in which it says, Ring it till the slave be free. And it was actually, ironically enough, kind of a rebuke on the system of slavery when William Lord Garrison referred to that. That despite that description on the Liberty Bell for freedom and liberty, the bell didn't proclaim liberty to all people so long as slavery was allowed to persist. I thought that was interesting. And, and quite honestly, I've never taught that before. Uh, but that's how we came up with the name, the Liberty Bell. It wasn't named that from, from the get-go. Uh, the, the Jubilee, the 50 years, plays in to what the Pennsylvania Assembly 
had ordered to do. The Liberty Bell, they wanted it in 1751 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of William Penn's charter. William Penn, who was Pennsylvania's named after the Quaker, written in 1701 uh, as Pennsylvania's first constitution. So that's a little bit of background to that Liberty Bell, which is still separated. But here's why I included that this morning. I don't know if you know who Dr. Ben Carson is. Under the Trump administration, he was the head of the Housing and Urban Development. I believe he's just unbelievable in his ability to see the true nature of America. Ben Carson had this to say about the Liberty Bell, and I just think this hits home in today's America so much. The Liberty Bell is much like America's story. We were forged with great ideas, inscribed upon our original design. Yet we have cast and recast, and for your knowledge, the Liberty Bell has been recast several times. They tried to get the crack out. They tried to fix it. In fact, it had an ugly sound in the beginning. They tried to recast it to get a better tuned sound. So it has been reshaped over and over again, and that's what he's referring to. Uh, yet we have cast and recast how we live towards the original idea, righting wrongs and correcting course time and time again, often, though, at an incredible cost. That sums us up, isn't it? The idea of America. All of these people today, all of, you know, it seems like our nation wants to focus on a lot of things that happened years and years ago and say, well, America has no idealism. There's nothing to me that's great about America because what was going on within the confines of the nation, it was never great. But the ideas were. That's what we celebrate on the 4th of July, the idea of America. We know as Christians, right, the idea of Jesus, his perfection. Can we ever live up to that? Absolutely not. We know that's not going to happen. But we are commanded. We are commanded to try the best we can. That's what America is. We can probably never live up to our ideas. But what makes us great is we try. Over and over and over again, we recast our nation. We reform to our ide idealism. But sometimes it comes an incredible cost. I just thought, Ben Carson, that's, that's good stuff. So this morning, let's talk about what is our American freedom based on? Because there's a lot of argument out there and a lot of debate. Quite frankly, as a teacher of, of many of your children here in this community, uh, you know, I have to be cognizant of what's out there, the leading thoughts about America today. And I tell you, folks, a lot of it is alarming, as you well know. It's alarming. And what does it continue to depend? So this morning, we're going to look at that. First, we're going to start off, let's look at how the world, our secular nation, meaning non-religious, non-Christian, the secular world looks at American freedom. First of all, they try to define it as a human desire to be free. A human desire to be free. We've seen this throughout our history, most notably in the 1960s, okay, uh, with the countercultural revolutions that went on. But we know one thing happens when that is your cornerstone when just your desire, your, your wants to just be free to do ever what you want to do, if that's your cornerstone of your nation, that can only lead to wanton disregard for morality, licentiousness. Don't tell me what to do. I can do anything I want to do. It doesn't have to be more. I, I have no code of conduct. It's all good as long as you tolerate it. Do we see this today? too much. Or they'll say it's a desire to be released from the overbearing control of the British, that our entire idea on the foundation of this country was just simply independence from Britain. And of course, along with that, they give you the no taxation without representation. Three, the basis of American independence is pluralism and multiculturalism. Here we get into the politically correct, the woke crowd, as they like to call it. They say that the motto of the United States and the only one 
that we should use. Latin, e pluribus unum. What does that mean? From many, one. That we can only be one united nation if we're all united and equal in that pursuit. So that multiculturalism is a celebration of that. And I agree. The problem comes in when they want to disregard this motto, in God we trust. They say there's no room for that. There's no room whatsoever. There's where we get into the problem. Four, this is a leading theory of today. Real foundation of America, independence, freedom, is economic, political, and social equality for all. Hear this a lot, don't we? I bet you know what's coming underneath this. Absolutely. Socialism. I teach to my students. We do a real easy, something that I hope they can remember about this. Okay? That word equality, which is a cornerstone of this nation. But when you really look at socialism and what it teaches, you can come up with socialism and this is simply about equality of outcome. The race is fixed. You don't compete anymore. Everybody crosses the finish line together. That, in essence, is socialism. Whereas we teach in our capitalist society, in our free society, that the idea of this nation is not equality of outcome. We're not guaranteeing you that. You've got to work hard in this country. You've got to earn it. What we guarantee or strive to guarantee in this country is equality of opportunity. The government's role is to remove the hurdles from everybody's lane. Everybody ought to have a fair race. Teddy Roosevelt called it the square deal. Everybody runs the same race. And then it's up to you. That's the idea there. And that's the difference. I like to look then at what is written. These all come from the media, these next things. Uh, notice this first quote. And I'll just read this real quickly. This comes from Jeffy, Jeff Schweitzer from the Huffington Post, a former White House aide of President Obama. Let us be perfectly clear. We are not now, nor have we ever been, a Christian nation. Anybody who ignorantly insists that our nation is founded on Christian ideas need only look at the four most important documents, the Declaration, the Articles, Federalist Papers, the Constitution, to disprove that ridiculous religious bias. That's what's being taught in our universities. That's what's being taught in America's classrooms. Let's go to another one. This comes from the book. Evangelic, uh, evangelica efforts to make America a Christian nation justified territorial expansion, which, by the way, is perceived as negative, obviously, while division over slavery solidified competing visions of Christian nationhood. Today's claims about America's founding as a Christian nation derive from this 19th century effort to overcome the skeptical reasoning and secular principles so important in the nation's founding. See, they want, to, they want to link our need to be based on a Christian nation. They want to say that has caused all of the problems within America. One more. The political events of the period also support the conclusion that the founders intended to institute a secular-based form of government. No religion whatsoever. Demographically speaking, and they do throw us a bone here, America certainly resembled a nation of Christians. We know that. They're admitting to it. But at the same time, its founding has ever since. But it's rather different proposition to claim that the founders established the new American government as a Christian nation. Clearly, they did not. And if you go online, you will see more and more and more of this. I just say that's Satan at work, quite literally. And then 
the thorn in our side. The one document that unfortunately points to this, and probably uh, not many of you have seen this. I'm not sure you're familiar with the Barbary Wars in the late 1700s, but our government signed what is known as the Treaty of Tripoli, and we're talking about the present-day country of Libya on the North African coast. See, there was a lot of piracy going on with American merchant ships, and remember, that got us into wars with England in 1812 as well, but the Muslims were pirating our commercial ve uh, vessels, and it eventually will lead to two separate wars uh, when we send in the Marines. This so-called Article 11, though, is what the people who say our nation has never been based on Christianity will point to. Because supposedly in this Article 11, it starts out as, as the government of the United States of America is not, in any sense, founded on the Christian religion. And they jump on that and throw that at us, big time. As it has in itself no character of amnity, I lost my place there, uh, enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of the Muslims. Obviously, you could see why it was written in there if it was indeed uh, written in there. It's trying to say that this treaty will not be overturned or it will not impart Christian values on uh, an obviously Muslim uh, area. But in research, I found some contradictions to that. First of all, it came from Secretary of War who was obviously instrumental in that, James McHenry. And he says, if we're not founded on Christianity, and this is talking to the people who wrote this treaty, what else is founded on? What is it founded on if it's not Christianity? He said, this act always appeared to me like trampling upon the cross. And as we've seen historical evidence come out about the Treaty of Tripoli, historians claim that when you look at the version that was given to the Muslims, which was written in Arabic, obviously so they could read it, Article 11 is not in there at all. It got in the English version, but it's not in the actual treaty that was given to the Muslims. I don't know one of history's mysteries, but they certainly throw that out at us, but obviously we can cast some doubt on that. You know, this type of thing reminds me of, of, of what happens in Christianity as well. We'll get to that in just a second. And finally... The creme de la creme. Have we not always heard this growing up? This country promotes separation of church and state. I want you to think real quick, where did that come from? Where do we get that? I see, we've heard it, right? Where did it come from? The fact of the matter is, this term, this idea, never appears in any official document throughout American history. If you look, you will not find it. This term is applied to the First Amendment right of freedom of religion, which in itself is a completely different concept. But you will not find that in a document. You know where this term comes from? A letter written by Thomas Jefferson to a group of men affiliated with the Danbury Baptist Association of Connecticut. That's where the term came from. A journalist caught wind of that, and, and we've been using it ever since. Folks, it's not in the foundation of this country. Just not. Can't find it. This type of stuff is exactly what happens in a lot of churches. We can make anything written down, and that's what history is, a written record. We can make anything appear to be something else. In fact, this morning, I want to share with you a verse out of the Bible. Psalm 14.1, this is in the Bible, I promise you. If you don't believe me, look it up. It says, there is no God. There is no God. It says that in the Bible, in Psalm 14.1. If you don't believe me, look it up right now. It's in there. But as everything else that's happening now, it's totally taken out of context. And when we talk about our nation not being a Christian nation, it's another example of everything taken out of context for a particular purpose. Atheists will use this. They'll quote it. They'll use it. Let's look at the actual verse. The fool 
says in his heart, there is no God. A little different meaning now, isn't there? It could be done with all historical documents. That's what we have to watch out about, not only as Christians, but as Americans. So what did our founding fathers actually pro proclaim about Christianity and the impact on our new nation? What did they actually have to say? I tell you what, in looking at letters, looking at documents, the ones I like to look at are from the Continental Congress. We know who those guys are, right? They're the ones that met. That includes all our founding fathers. And what they put forth to me best resonates amongst us as the true Christian foundation. This is rather lengthy, but I feel like I need to read this, and, and I hope that you will read along. This comes from October 20th, a meeting of the Continental Congress, 1779, published for all to see. Whereas it becomes us humbly to approach the throne of Almighty God with gratitude and praise for the wonders which his goodness has wrought in conducting our forefathers to this western world, for his protection to them and to their pros uh, posterity amid difficulties and dangers, for raising us, their children, from deep distress to be numbered among the nations of the earth, and above all, that he hath diffused the glorious light of the gospel, whereby through the merits of our gracious Redeemer we may become the heirs of his eternal glory. Therefore resolved that it is recommended to the several states to appoint Thursday, the 9th of December, next to be a day of public and solemn thanksgiving to the almighty God for his mercies and of prayers for the continuance of his favor and protection to these united states. How can you argue with that? That's coming from our very own Continental Congress, creating a holiday. That he would grant to his church the plentiful effusions of divine grace and pour out of his Holy Spirit on all, that he would bless and prosper the means of education and spread the light of Christian knowledge through the remote corners of the earth. That he would in mercy look down upon us, pardon our sins, and receive us into his favor. And finally, that he would establish the independence of these United States upon the basis of religion and virtue. Any support and protect them in the enjoyment of peace, liberty, and safety as long as the sun and moon shall endure until time shall be no more. 20th day of October, 1789, we're right in the middle of that Revolutionary War. That was written by Samuel Huntington, president of the Continental Congress. Folks, it's right there in black and white. There's the truth. Cannot be argued against. Forget letters, forget hearsay, forget innuendos, forget all of the things that you want to proclaim. Historically, as a historian, this is the best primary source you can have. It's right in our hands. I'll go you one further. Noah Webster. You know what he created? English students know the Webster Dictionary. Okay? This is something that he wrote. Our citizens should early understand that the genuine source of correct Republican principles is the Bible. Amen. Particularly the New Testament or the Christian religion. Almost all of the civil liberty, freedom, now enjoyed in the world, owes its origin to the principles of the Christian religion. Isn't that strong? Civil liberty, as many want today, has been gradually advancing and improving as genuine Christianity has prevailed. Boy, you wouldn't hear that across America today, would you? You would hear right the opposite. Wonderful, wonderful words from Noah Webster. He goes on. The religion which has introduced civil liberty is a religion of Christ and his apostles, which enjoins humility, piety, and benevolence, which acknowledges in every person a brother or sister and a citizen with equal rights. There's your equality. Where can equality be found? Not in government, in Christ. And to this we owe our free constitutions of government, written in the history of the United States as a book 
from Webster. He was a historian as well, 1838. Folks, it's very simple. Our republic is dependent and founded on the principles of Christianity. Clear cut. Documents to prove it. One last thing. That famous phrase Evan read from the Declaration, to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. You know, we focus on the first two. They're kind of interchangeable. Pursuit of life, we want to live life to the fullest. Liberty, our freedom. We don't often talk about that last one because it's a little bit more difficult to define. Pursuit of happiness. And when you start talking about the American dream and what we want from America in terms of what is our satisfaction, what's our happiness, it can lead you down many different roads in a secular world. Because most people believe that their happiness is directly tied to their physical and emotional status in life. Isn't that all we see now? We see that all over, whether it's school, whether it's online, whether it's in society, TVs, movies. People define their happiness in the secular world from things like their status and their popularity and how many friends they have and who their friends are. They define it by their possessions, their homes. You know, do they have a fancy car? What kind of clothes do they wear? Their relationships. As long as I'm dating so-and-so or I'm married to so-and-so, that's, that's my happiness. Or... Unfortunately, as we've seen, it's all about power over others. But our founding fathers had a different view, and we can see that in their writings because they went back to the Bible. What does the Bible say about finding happiness? Out of Psalms, look at these verses. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Happy is he who's been the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord, his God. He who heeds the word wisely will find good, and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Finally, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraints, but happy is he who keeps the law. That was certainly, Proverbs was certainly a foundation for our decision to be a republic. You see in there, happy is he who does what? Keeps the law. There's a cornerstone there. You look at some writings, John Adams, our second president, and, and his son. This is from his son's book, John Quincy Adams, our sixth president. Great is my veneration for the Bible. And so strong my belief that when duly read and meditated on, it is of all books in the world that which contributes more to make men good, wise, and happy. You think he read Psalms and Proverbs? I bet he did. I call it the source of all human virtue and happiness. Man must hold his felicity and virtue on the condition of obedience to God's will. Tell me we're not founded. Upon God's word. Tell me that our founding fathers weren't basing everything that they did on this cornerstone and this foundation. Ecclesiastes says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. And I can't help but think this is a cornerstone of this country. And it is the reason why we are the greatest nation in the world. Go back to the Continental Congress. We're almost done. 1782, this is when we're forming the Union. And they do further recommend to all ranks to testify their gratitude to God for his goodness by cheerful obedience to his laws, not the law of the land, his laws, and by promoting each in his station and by his influence the practice of true and undefiled religion which is the great foundation of public prosperity and national happiness. You can't say it any better than that. And that comes from our Congress. But yet today, we are being told something completely different. Today, happiness depends on a government that provides for you, right? That you get a check. You don't have to do anything. That the government takes care of you. It tells us happiness is lawlessness. 
rule of the mob, right? Direct democracy in our major urban areas. And most of all, happiness in this country can only be achieved through a secular freedom from organized religion. How wrong that is. It just does not fit. It's putting a square peg into a round hole considering what our founding fathers have established in this country. According to our founding fathers, the entire nation's happiness depends on the majority of its citizens demonstrating thankfulness to a gracious Heavenly Father and obeying His will. The cornerstone of both this nation and what we live our lives for. Last quote from George Washington. We got to end with George Washington, right? He'd never lead us wrong. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would the man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. Yet that's exactly what the world today and Satan want to do. They want to subvert and pervert our founding Christian beliefs. They are not patriots. Patriots are the ones who hold firm to this country. Moses warns in Deuteronomy, Set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe. All the words of this law, for it is not futile thing for you, because it is your life. The law is your life, and by this word you shall prolong your days in the land. We must have a great awakening, folks. We must have awakening back to God's word. If we want this country to last for another century, we've got to turn back to our foundations. We've got to turn back to God, and we've got to get back in his favor as a country. It's as simple as that. Go back to our foundation. And this morning, this morning on July 4th, if you really want to celebrate Independence Day, if you really truly want to ce celebrate Independence Day, you have to be set free from sin, as Romans 6.18 says. How do we do that? If you haven't been baptized into Christ, if you haven't put Christ on in baptism, come today. Set yourself free from sin. Or if things in your life aren't going right, come down here today. Let us pray with you. Let us study with you. Let us talk with you. Let's get those right because every single American should enjoy freedom. And every single Christian enjoys freedom from sin. If you have a need, please come as we stand and sing.